as I said tonight, we're just going to look at the first three verses of Hosea chapter 6. Now, Hosea was a prophet of God living in the 8th century BC. He was a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah, so he would have lived roughly 220 or so years after David's death and over 700 or so years before Jesus came. Now, Isaiah was focused particularly on Judah and very especially on the wealthy classes in Jerusalem. But Hosea prophesied both to the northern kingdom of Israel and to the southern kingdom of Judah. And his prophecy concerned God's judgment upon both nations. Now, it's interesting because when Hosea started his ministry, in actual fact, both nations were going through periods of unprecedented prosperity. So in the northern kingdom, you have King Jeroboam II, who was Israel's most successful king. He expanded the borders of the nation. He even conquered Damascus. And then if you go south into Judah, you have Uzziah, who again was a very successful king. He had this huge standing army. So these nations were both very powerful and wealthy, standard of living had never been better, and they were secure, apparently. And yet spiritually, all was not well. The, the northern kingdom of Israel overtly, the southern kingdom of Judah covertly, but both nations were guilty of spiritual adultery against their God. They'd moved over time, perhaps imperceptible to begin with, but they'd moved from a position of faithful obedience to Jehovah, and they'd increasingly adopted the practices and the customs of the pagan nations around and their values. And you see, because their national fortunes seemed to be on the up, well, it just emboldened them to carry on the way they were. It's a little reminder for us, actually, straight away, that just because we may know material blessing in our lives and everything apparently is going well physically with our health, our job and everything, it doesn't mean necessarily that all is well spiritually. It doesn't mean that God necessarily endorses everything that we're doing. And, and sometimes, in fact, judgment from the Lord can be in the form of material blessing. Sometimes he can give us over to what we think we want and what we think we need. Psalm 108.15 talks about how in the wilderness God gave the rebellious Israelites what they wanted, but it says he sent leanness into their souls. And this is what's going on in Israel and Judah. Their stomachs are full, business has never been better, it's booming, but their souls are spiritually starving. And yet in stubbornness and pride, they still won't return to God. Chapter 5, verse 4 says, A spirit of prostitution is in their heart. They do not acknowledge the Lord. Now, it, it couldn't continue, and God wasn't going to let it continue, and his judgment was going to come. And this is a big part of Hosea's message, especially to the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, Israel is really going to go through the mill. Jeroboam's son and heir is going to come to ruin. He's going to lose his throne within a few months of ascending to the throne. And the royal house of Jehu is going to fade and end. And the prosperity and the power of Israel is going to fade. And in the end, in a frighteningly short space of time, just a few decades, Israel is going to be swallowed up by the mighty Assyrian Empire. And they will never again exist as a kingdom. You might think, well, that's pretty depressing. And yet woven throughout this dark book is a real message of hope of God's faithfulness that we just sang about his love for his wayward people I mean after all Hosea's very name actually means salvation and this is the hope that Hosea holds out for these people and this is where chapter 6 comes into play and there are just three things I want to, to point out as we go through these three verses together but let's look initially at the first two verses it says, come, let us return to the Lord. He has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He's injured us, but he'll bind up our wounds. After two days, he'll revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. 
Now notice, first of all, the way verse 1 speaks of, of how God deals with his people. He has torn us to pieces. He's injured us. And you might think, well, with friends like that, who needs enemies? And uh, with our modern-day sensitivities, you know, you can imagine our society thinking, oh, you know, God is guilty of cosmic child abuse. Look at, look at the way he deals with these, these children of his that he purports to love. What's all this about? Well, do you remember what Proverbs 27.6 says? It says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. So your enemy might sugarcoat his language and flatter you and say lovely things to you, but it's not for your good. It's actually to hide his true intentions. He's still your enemy. He just perhaps doesn't want you to realize it straight away. I think the prime example of this is how Judas Iscariot in the Garden of Gethsemane went straight up to Jesus and gave him a kiss. But it wasn't a kiss of good intent, was it? It was a kiss of deceit, of betrayal. Whereas your true friend may very occasionally be compelled to state truths that perhaps hit home and perhaps are hurtful, because the truth can be hurtful, can't it? But he, he does so reluctantly, but with the very best of intentions. He does it out of love and loyalty to you to help you. And Jehovah, the covenant God, he's the very best of friends. So he, he never tickles our ears and just tells us exactly what we want to hear. Now, some people, of course, only hear what they want to hear. But that's a selective deafness. God's word is for all seasons. And it warns and it rebukes and it encourages and it comforts. It, it does all things. Whatever we need, it provides us. Now, sometimes, as I said, sometimes God may, just for a time, in judgment, give us over to what we think we want. But that's never forever. And, and the Lord is always very upfront with us. His word never flatters us or deceives us, does it? Far from it. He speaks truth to us. And he's even prepared to wound us so that he can wake us up and return us to him. He's never gratuitous or disproportionate in his violence, and he always desires our restoration. Now, do you remember we saw a few weeks ago in uh, 2 Samuel 24 how King David was given this impossible choice? It was either famine, or it was uh, enemy invasion, or it was plague. And in the end, David decided that he was going to fall into the hands of the Lord. Now, David knew a thing or two about the wounds of his divine friend. But he knew that the judge was also the shepherd, and he was David's shepherd. And David knew that love and mercy weren't just sort of exceptions or one-offs to the divine rule. They're, they're part of who God is. And so David was quite happy to rest in the mercy of God than be at the mercy of human enemies. He would rather trust the, the wounds of his friend than, than the flattery of his enemies. And in this coming day of disaster, Israel, who are going to be bashed about, displaced, dispersed, they're being called by Hosea the prophet to seek that same God, David's God, the, the same Lord who, who we worship, the Lord we're told about in Hebrews, who disciplines those he loves. And punishes everyone he accepts as a son. So God's discipline is hard. It would be hard for Israel. It was like a lion almost. He was going to tear his prey. But he hasn't actually devoured Israel and eaten them up completely. In fact, it says he's willing to heal up and bind the wounds he's inflicted. So the hands that tear are the same hands that bind and I want you to notice, secondly, that the beautiful promise that follows this, that if and when the scattered people of Israel return repentant and humbled back to the Lord, he's not going to sulk. He's not going to hold a grudge. He's not going to keep her in suspense. He will absolutely surely receive her and restore her. Now, Hosea says that God will respond after two days and that the people will rise again on the third day. Now, it's obviously not literal. 
but it is symbolic of the swiftness of God's response. So when the people are sincere in their repentance and they come with all their hearts, God is swift to respond. It's like the old hymn that says, slow to chide, swift to bless. Do you remember the parable of the prodigal son? Do you remember this son? He'd been gone a long time, don't know how long, but certainly long enough to squander his fortune. Perhaps years had gone by, and it's not out of sight, out of mind. Because he, he literally only needs to appear as a small dot on the distant horizon on the road home. And his father is immediately there, running out to meet him. God is always swift to receive his people. And, and we're not so dissimilar, are we, really, to the, the prodigal son or, or Old Testament Israel. That's where we sit in the story. I've said this before, but sometimes we, we read the Bible with a rather egocentric uh, set of spectacles and we think well I'm the hero in this so uh, who am I not like and I'm not like all these these sinners but actually that's exactly who we are like that's where we sit we're not the heroes of the bible story we're the wandering sheep we're like the prodigal son we're like old testament Israel our love fluctuates doesn't it sometimes you know you perhaps you're you're singing a hymn or you're in a sermon and or you just read something in the word and it deeply moves you and you just, you know, you almost want to cry out to the Lord how much you love him. But other times, you can feel incredibly cold, can't you? And, and disinterested. We're almost schizophrenic in that sense. We, we can up and then we're down. And often, in our hearts and our minds, we can wander away. Um, it says in that old hymn, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it prone to leave the God I love. But the great news is, the wonderful news is, that there's always a way back. There's always a royal welcome when we return. Because as the, the parable of the prodigal son shows us, the, the return of the wayward sinner to the Father in heaven, it's responded to with grace, with love, with rejoicing. And as this chapter shows us, the Lord is swift to bless. There's no cold war you know, no silent treatment for the repentant believer, no period of probation where he decides whether we're sincere or not. James 4 is clear, isn't it? Draw near to God, and he will, he will draw near to you. And that's, that's a measure of God's love for us, because let's be honest, let's not beat about the bush, God doesn't need us at all. God can easily accomplish his purposes without us, can't he? And he doesn't need our company. Because he, he's self-sufficient, he's the triune God. He, he doesn't need us, and yet he genuinely loves us. Not for what we can give him, but because he does. He genuinely desires real relationship with his people. And in the face of our faithlessness, he doesn't treat us as our sins deserve. He does not reward us according to our iniquities. He remembers that all things considered, we are but frail children of dust. And he sympathizes with us in our weakness, we're told in Hebrews. And these are the kinds of truths about God that Hosea is urging the Israelites to reflect upon. Currently for them, the sun is shining, the economy is booming, but there's a day of disaster coming. And in that day... Hosea says there's this wonderful divine promise. When you seek him, the Lord will swiftly respond. Now, I guess the question is, will they? Will they ever return? The onus is very definitely on them. And Hosea is urging these wayward people to return to God, to wholly seek him in faith. Verse 3, let us acknowledge the Lord... Let us press on to acknowledge him. Now, notice this phrase, let us press on to acknowledge him. It clearly means more than like an offhand intellectual acknowledgement, like a nod, and then carry on as before. Because, as we know, these people were already outwardly religious. They were already outwardly acknowledging the Lord. And the, the phrase can be also translated, literally, let us pursue to know the Lord, which gives us, I think, a better idea, really, that the people are to run, to chase, to expend energy in actively 
seeking after God. Now, I'm sure I've, I've, I'm going to dine out on this for a while, but when I ran at the, uh, the sports at the Vrongate show yesterday, my legs started to go faster and faster, and then, and then I was going so fast, my legs collapsed on me, and uh, I fell across the finish line and damaged my shoulder. So I felt very foolish. But if you can imagine that kind of running, you know, actively pursuing after the Lord, I really want to get to him. That, that's, I think, the idea here. It, it's something that we're not to sort of do casually, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll come back, but to really run to him. And notice that they're not just running after a God of their own making, but, but the true God, the Lord, which is Yahweh, the covenant God of Israel, Jehovah, and knowledge of him is to be the object of their pursuit. They are to pursue to know the Lord. You see, really, it was because their knowledge of the Lord was deficient in the first place that they had wandered, which is why we always wander. Not just because sin is attractive, but because often we have a deficient knowledge of the Lord. We don't love him and know him as we should. And so now... Hosea is saying there to, to seek, to run, to get to know him better. Not intellectual understanding alone, heart knowledge. To, to truly know and to be gripped by the truth. Gripped by the knowledge that this is a holy God. He is offended by my sin. I've wounded him. But he's also the God of the covenant. He's made promises to Israel. He's made promises to me. He's a God of steadfast love and mercy. And he will receive the repentant sinner. You see, I think it's quite easy to be content with what we know. As Christians, of course, what we know is sufficient for salvation. And if we never learn anything else, we, we have enough, don't we? We know what we need to know. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing more we can know. I mean, when I got married to Lucia, I think she'd have been a bit upset if I decided that what I knew of her then was sufficient and I wouldn't need to ever get to know her any better than I did 12, 13 years ago. And how much more so with an infinite God? We should pursue a greater, deeper knowledge of the Lord. Because Christianity is not a religion, is it? It's a relationship with a living God, a relational God. And like any relationship, when we stop seeking to know him, there is a danger, isn't there, of complacency and over-familiarity. And, and so what happens? Well, we just stop exactly where we are. We get stuck where we are, and this is where Satan is so clever at taking advantage of, of our attitude of complacency. And in the end, not only do we fail to pursue a greater knowledge of God in his word, our grip of what we do know fades. And God becomes overly familiar, and we lose the wonder of our salvation. And we lose the wonder of who Jesus is. And this is where Israel were. They'd lost all of that. And, and the question is for us, what happens if we're in the same boat as they were? What happens to us if, like Israel, we're guilty of spiritual prostitution, of dabbling with smaller gods, of giving our affections to other things? What do we do, perhaps, when we've fallen away? We're compromised, entangled in our sin? Or perhaps we just feel barren and cold, and we want to come back, and we're not sure if we can. And we're anxious, will the Lord receive us? Well, Hosea's already made it clear, hasn't he, that the Lord is swift in his response. But what Hosea is now going to do is give a special emphasis for us on what the Lord really will do. It's as if he anticipates that Israel were lacking confidence to return. They were perhaps believing in that day of disaster that God had deserted them forever, that he cut them off that they'd sinned too far. And you see, that's um, how often we feel. And Satan will often whisper a little bit of condemnation in our ear, that there's no way back. You've gone too far this time. So Hosea says these wonderful words in verse 3. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains, like the spring rains that water the earth. It's emphatic, isn't it? He will. So in other words, this isn't going to be a forlorn chase. This is not going to be, well, I've offended God. I'm trying to seek him, but I've no idea if he'll come. You know, perhaps he's playing hard to get. You know, I, 
I doubt the friendship will ever be the same again. No, Hosea is very clear here. God will come to their aid. It's as certain as the rising of the sun or the winter rain following a, a long hot summer. We, we take these things for granted. They happen like clockwork, don't we? Do we ever doubt that the sun's going to rise? I know we don't always see it in this country, but we don't doubt that the sun will appear. And that's how inevitable God's appearing is going to be. He is faithful to what he's promised, to who he is. And his faithfulness is always the decisive thing. Now, what we're, we're talking about here is the return of a backsliding believer to the Lord. And we call that repentance, don't we? It's turning away from one's sin and turning to God and pursuing him. And humanly speaking, that's an impossible thing. How does someone who is cold of heart, entangled in sin, compromised up to the hilt, ever come to repentance? I mean, what if they're not repentant enough? Will they be received? And, and we can be as coy and as doubtful and worried as Israel perhaps were about returning to God. I mean, do I have what it takes to be repentant? Am I mature enough? You've heard people say, have I grieved over my sin enough? Have I shed enough tears? Don't think you can ever shed enough tears. But the point is, these questions look in the wrong place, don't they? Because they look within. And true repentance looks upwards to God's faithfulness. Because repentance is always God's work in us. It's a miracle of God's grace. So when sin takes hold in our lives and Satan draws near to fill us with doubt, and it seems for all the world that we'll never return, our strength of will, our determination to return, that's not the decisive thing. God's faithfulness is. He is the shepherd who goes after that solitary lost sheep. He's the Lord who never lets us fall beyond recovery. He won't allow doubt and fear to swallow us up for good. He won't let us grow so cold that our hearts freeze over and we can never respond to him. Now, the process may take a long time. Some people can wander for years and years and years. And God may have to sometimes do to us what he did to Israel. Tear us apart and wound us. But whatever it takes, through his indwelling spirit, God will convict and he'll prompt and he'll exhort and he'll send us people to talk to us and he'll talk to us in his word. And if we're not even reading the word, he'll use our circumstances to reach us. He'll use people in our lives who are good and bad. And, and he may make us feel pretty miserable at times. But the point is, he's faithful to who he is to what he's promised us through the Lord Jesus. He refuses to allow his people to fall off the cliff and be destroyed. He won't let it, won't let it happen. If you think of an example of that, well, isn't Peter an example of that? Because Peter, in his own way, betrayed Jesus just as badly as Judas did. You know, he, we're told he denied, he swore curses, he got very angry. He was very insistent, I don't know Jesus. So, he failed the Lord completely. There should have been no way back. And it wasn't Peter's strength of feeling that was decisive. It was Jesus. Jesus had even said to him, when you turn back, greet your brothers. Because Jesus knew what was going to happen. It is painful, isn't it, the Lord's discipline? But it is designed to bring to us in ourselves that miracle from God, that repentance, which is actually the fruit of of God's work within us. It's actually the identifying sign that we are Christians. Christians are men and women who do repent, not because of any good in them, but because they have the Holy Spirit of God working in them. They're protected by him. And when we come back, God binds up the wounds and he welcomes us back. He draws us with love. And if you're a child of God's tonight, well, that whole process that seems so uncertain perhaps to us is as inevitable as the sun rising with the dawn God's faithfulness is that inevitable and therefore these words of Hosea are timeless aren't they and like Hosea I think we can use these words we can encourage each other 
in the faithfulness of our God. And we can speak to each other. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let's press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear when we seek him. He's not playing hard to get. He will appear. He will come to us like the winter rains and like the spring rains that water the earth. And there is one final thing here, and I'm sure you knew that I hadn't missed it. And I'm sure the symbolism of verses 1 and 2 didn't uh, escape you either. He's torn us to pieces, but he'll heal us. He's injured us and he'll bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will restore us that we may live in his presence. I mean, how is it that God can ever receive us back? You know, we may be as repentant as we like. We may uh, shed as many tears as we could do, but we can't unsin those sins. We can't undo the wrong we've done. And of course, the answer, as we know, is the gospel. Our sins are forgiven. We're free to return to the Lord because our sins have been paid for and full by Christ. Christ was literally torn to pieces, wasn't he? By the wrath of God upon our sins. Our stripes were laid upon him. And having been cut off from the land of the living and torn apart by the Lord's wrath, he spent two days in the tomb, but on the third day, he was restored to life. He was restored into his father's presence. And because of his sacrifice, our sins, although they are a grief to God, they do not condemn us. There is a way back to him from the dark past of sin. There is a door open for us to go in. And Jesus is the door, isn't he? Jesus is that supreme person who connects us with almighty God. He has paid the price of all our sins, past present and we don't always think about this do we all the sins that we're going to commit when we leave this hall tonight they've all been paid for and we can freely return to the father and just as Christ was restored on the third day to resurrection life so one day we will have resurrection life forever in glory so this dark prophecy has this wonderful light this shining hope and it's the hope is in God, isn't it? And in his son, in, in the faithful character of the God who's promised and never goes back on a promise he's made and who sent his son to atone for our sins on the cross. So let's praise God for who he is and for who his son is and look to him and pursue him in these dark days that we're living in. Amen.